Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Matt. I uh, work at Fiverr. I focus on digital community engagement. Um, and today I get the great pleasure of interviewing uh, Josh Cole, who is the CMO of SkyZone. Uh, hi, Josh. Hi, Matt. Thanks for uh, the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to talking with you. Great. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, how to leverage uh, data uh, to optimize your omnichannel experience uh, for your business. Uh, for those who are not familiar uh, with uh, SkyZone, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what it is and what you do for them. Yeah, so SkyZone is the uh, original business in an industry called uh, indoor trampoline parks. So um, uh, the founder of SkyZone started a whole industry back in 2004. And the idea of the first trampoline park is a bed of trampolines and uh, sidewalls, and you can jump, uh, do flips and activities. And uh, he created a foam zone you can jump into and some basketball hoops you can jump and dunk on because uh, a lot of us dream of dunking one day, but actually never quite get up there. So the trampoline helps um, a couple different sizes of, of basketball hoops. And uh, uh, that business took off and we we're uh, copied quite a bit uh, and the industry grew and grew and grew. And then over the last uh, few years, as we've uh, grown and um, uh, changed with the times, we've added a lot more attractions to the sky zones, like uh, Ninja Warrior courses, um, climbing walls, uh, zip lines. But the commonality is active play. So we're big believers in the importance of active play. Electronics are great. Technology is great. But everyone needs to get off the sofa uh, and get up and get exercise and uh, ideally do something that's fun, keep people engaged. And that type of active play is uh, stress relieving and uh, has a lot of um, psychological benefits and developmental benefits for kids. So uh, we're, we're big believers in the health benefits of it. And if you haven't jumped on a trampoline for 30 minutes straight, uh, trust me, it's very, very tiring. It's a lot of exercise. So that's Sky Zone. And what I would add to it is um, we're bigger than some people um, uh, realize. We actually have uh, over 200 parks, locations, but we call them parks, trampoline parks. And uh, those are in about 12 countries around the world. So we're in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Guatemala, Colombia, uh, the majority are, are in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and Australia, but we've expanded to, uh, you know, pretty much all corners of the world. And now we're looking to expand in, in Asia. We have the first foothold in China and looking for some more opportunities in Asia. And um, we're a franchise business. I'll add this because it might color some of my comments that come up. Um, about 85% of our parks are owned and operated by a franchisee. We are the franchisor, which means we license the brand. We provide guidance and other um, uh, help the franchisees to be successful, but we have to be uh, mutually successful together. So there's a big partnership between a franchisor and a franchisee. So 85% franchised, 15% we own and operate on our own. So we uh, we, we control those uh, those parks. Um, and overseas, internationally, almost all of them are uh, franchised with a franchise license. So uh, that's, that's Sky Zone. Uh, if you haven't tried it out, hopefully there's one in your area or one coming soon and uh, go try it. It's a lot of fun and great exercise. So I'm going to keep my kids out of here because if they heard you say that, they would live at one of those. It's we have we have smaller ones here in the areas where I live, and it's when we do go, it's hours and hours of time, and it's just it's so much fun to to jump around, and I, I definitely uh, am am a fan. Um, so you uh, you're you CMO uh, for for Sky Zone. Um, what what does marketing look like for for you know in an in, in international trampoline uh, park? It's, it's fairly complex. When I think about my job today versus some previous jobs I've had and uh, talking to the marketers, like the jobs they have, it's fairly complex to be in the, the franchised world and with some unique challenges. And also it's, um, <clears throat> it's omni-channel. By the way, may I say, excuse me, because I um, had the flu last week. And it was a flu. I was COVID tested. Uh, and I get <laughs> off of it. And uh, I'm 95% better, but I still have some congestion. So if I cough, or I lose my voice, uh, apologies for that. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's fairly complex because on one, one hand, it's all it's omni-channel. You've got to attract guests online, find them online, ideally, and then bring them into a, a physical location and then entertain them in that location and entertain them in a way that makes them want to come back and tell their friends how great a time they had. So there's an omni-channel element to it. But there's also the complexity of the franchisee-franchisor relationship and, and McDonald's, Subway, uh, they're, they're Tons of huge, big franchise businesses out there. Um, and in any of them, there are certain complexities. And it's the relationship between the franchisee and the franchisor. And each has their own responsibilities to market the brand. And you have to, as a franchisee, you have to help the franchisor. Uh, sorry, as a franchisor, which we are, you have to help the franchisees quite a bit. Um, 
So that's the complexity. And did you ask like, what's it, do, you, do you want to lay the land of like what marketing looks I, like? I mean, yeah, I would, I would love, I would love to hear that. Um, it, the, for me, it's, it's really interesting. Cause like uh, you as a, uh, as the company, as the franchise, or you have a responsibility for everybody to succeed, but then you're going to have different, uh, different triggers and different things for every market. And that, that to right. me is actually very interesting. Yeah. So, the, so stepping back, think about this. This is an easy way, you know, a simple way to think about it. The franchise or, be it Sky Zone, be it McDonald's, but let's talk about Sky Zone, is responsible for the brand. You want to have a brand that people know and love and, and is top of mind, all things that are important about brand marketing. Typically speaking, a franchisee at the local level is not thinking about the global brand. They're thinking about what's happening in their local market. If you have a, a Sky Zone in Providence, Rhode Island, that owner is thinking about Providence, Rhode Island, and how to get as many people as possible in Providence, Rhode Island to come in and have a birthday party with us or just come and bring your kids in on Saturday afternoon. That's their concern. They're not so worried about how the brand resonates in, uh, you know, in Omaha, because it doesn't affect them that much. So as a franchisor, you have to think about the brand. So there's, there's an onus on us to make sure that that brand is known and loved and has relevance and is an ongoing, uh, you know, it has an ongoing relevance over time and stays stays relevant. That's the high level. That's on us. The next level down is promotional thing, promotional activities. So we put out a calendar. So maybe once a quarter, we run a promotion, maybe like a limited time offer to come in at a special price uh, or to buy a membership at a special price for maybe like, you know, the next week. So we'll create a promotional calendar and they're not, they're not all discounts. Sometimes it's a, a value add and we'll go out to our franchisees and say, here's a calendar. And we're creating assets, uh, creative assets for these promotions. And this is when we're going to run it. And what we're going to do is what we need you to do because we need them to also advertise on the local level. They have a commitment to spend some money on the local level and they have a commitment to send us some money to advertise nationally. So, okay, we're going to do this. You can do, guys do that. And we orchestrate it. We're kind of like the quarterbacks, but we need each of them to execute locally. Um, and we'll run some very targeted ads to support it. But we'll say to them, but you also need to do X, Y, and Z. And then also um, on the next level down, I think about ongoing day in, day out support for the franchisees. They're running birthday parties, big part of the business. Um, an event like we have something called Glow on Thursday or Friday nights, uh, black lights turn on. So if you have the right clothing and socks, they'll, they'll glow in the dark. And it was really fun if you aim for teenagers for that. Yeah. And so we'll create creative assets and a playbook. And how do you how do you run a Glow event? How do you market it? How do you target the right audience? Because that's a teenage audience versus mm -hmm. the parents who are booking birthday parties. And so we'll sure. provide all types of help to the franchisees so that on their local level, they can market Glow. They can market the birthday parties. They can market just a Saturday afternoon, come in and check out the warrior course. So we're the onus is on us to create really cool marketing assets, probably relevant to a lot of your listeners in the, in the graphic design world and so forth. So how do you create those assets to hand off to the franchisees so they can run them in the local market and uh, be successful? And then the next last part of this puzzle is we are, we're always looking to expand. So we also have B2B marketing responsibilities that we want to find new franchise owner, if we, franchisees, we call them franchise partners, actually. So how do you find new franchisees to keep growing the business and whether that's international or domestic. So there's a, there's that B2B side with a different type of advertising and a different type of um, sales funnel and, uh, and all that. That is a very multi-level omni-channel uh, marketing strategy. Um, and actually the, what you, what you're talking about with, with targeting and finding the right audience that actually uh, there's a question right now saying, you know, what, what kind of data um, do you gather? And it's a good, a great transition uh, piece. What kind of data do you collect from individuals who are coming to use a uh, sky zone and how do you collect that data since it's mostly in person events, right? Yeah. And, I, and thank you. Whoever asked that question, because I think it's so important for us as marketers today to be sophisticated in our understanding of how to use da data, how to, how to access it, how to segment it. It's, uh, it, it's so crucial. And with all the announcements from Google even this week, and, uh, you know, the ongoing conversation about the elimination of third party cookies, uh, that also makes data that much more important, first party data. So this is super topical, very important and near and dear to my heart. So we're kind of lucky. So speaking of skies in the world, if you think about active sports that you've taken part in, this is called a ski resort. Um, usually you have to sign a waiver before you ski because while most people ski for the other day and don't get hurt, there are cases of injuries. So you need to sign a liability waiver that says, I understand there's risks, it's a physical activity, da, 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 da. That's usually a requirement in every uh, ski resort and so forth. And Sky Zone is no different. The incidence of injury is very, very low. It's lower than playing high school soccer, 
but you can get hurt because you're jumping on a trampoline and you might be out of shape or, you know, there are accidents happen. So we have people sign a liability waiver. That is a gold mine because unlike other businesses that have to beg you to or find ways to get you to give data or, or incentivize it, we basically say, if you don't sign this waiver, you cannot participate in our uh, business. It's just, it's, it's a requirement across every venue and every jumper we call them, our guests or jumpers. And on that waiver, there's an op, you know, an opt-in and a lot of the guests, um, uh, opt in to pro provide that data for, uh, to us to, sorry, provide the opportunity for us to continue to market to them. And so we have millions of guests coming in and then millions of waivers and the majority of them uh, allow us to reach out and market. So we've got that data if, and it's a huge advantage. And going back to that world of Google, a little complicated answer, but like every announcement that Google has made has highlighted the importance of first party data. Since third party cookies are being eliminated and it's gonna be harder to use third party, um, yeah, third party cookies to target and track any first party data that you own, first party being your own, becomes that much more important. And whether that's, you know, we're talking about Facebook who has a lot of data as an advertiser or, or a business like Skyzone that has its own data, we can use that to target. So we, um, we have been pretty sophisticated, I think, in how we use it and we're continuing to try to refine that. And for us, I'll just give, one more, just give a little more color to what we do. We take that data and we use it in two ways. How do you target successfully using the data or be effective with it? And then how do you track? And so with the targeting, we could say, okay, Matt's birthday is in you know November 15th. So we're going to hit him with some ads relevant to his birthday that time period because the waiver includes the date of birth. Um, and something like 88% of the email that we get on the waiver, we can match on Facebook with a Facebook account, which is pretty amazing. So one, people are very honest. Uh, thankfully. And then two, they, there's a lot of consistency between the email they give us and the Facebook account. So we can now go to, for example, it's one way Facebook, do a custom audience list and say, okay, whose birthday is in November? Um, who's a last user who hasn't been back in eight months? And can we send, send them a special message or come back and we miss you? Maybe here's an offer. Um, so lapsed user. So that's the targeting. And then the tracking is, is this is the kind of the, the, the gold mine is that we're able to track not only who purchases online, like anyone can now track someone clicks on an ad, they go to a store, they check out online, you can match it up through the pixels easy. What's harder is when someone comes to the store in an omni-channel and buys. And, and to this day, 80% of transactions in the US are still offline. Uh, E-commerce is like, you know, Q4 is roughly 18 to 20%, depending on which report you read, but 80% are still offline. Most retailers have a hard time tracking to the online, uh, offline conversion. Because of our waivers, we can actually match we can pull who's come to the park in the last week or 10 days, look at who's got an ad and match, track the conversion, which is very helpful for us because then that helps us optimize better which ads are actually working, not just generating the 20% of online sales, but actually generating the 80% of offline sales. And that is very useful information for figuring out which ads work and then how do you find the lookalikes and all that type of thing you can yeah. do with the offline conversion tracking. That's amazing. I'm just thinking in my head. I think we need to start opening up little little shops around the around the world and just start having people sign waivers and just starting to collect that information. That, right. as you said, it, that sounds like a gold mine and, and a very amazing way to start the relationship with the consumer and having that that connection point and starting to collect data. Um, you, I was going to ask about uh, incentivizing customers to to give you data, but uh, you don't really need that incentivization. Like the incentivization is to jump on trampolines and have a great time. Like that's, yeah. that's <laughs> what it is. I, I mean, my, my last job, I worked at Universal Studios in the theme park world for uh, quite a few years. And I oversaw data driven marketing there too. And we're, we were always trying to figure out how do you get our guests to give us an email address? And we went through like, let's ask the cashier, okay, that's taking too long. Let's try to get it online. Like we just went through, you know, we're always trying to devise ways. Let's give it you know, this, let's give that. And when it came to Sky Zone, I was like, wait a minute, how many records do we have? And, you know, they're just given to us. It was kind yeah, of wait. <laughs> uh, shocking and uh, in a good way. So there's pros and cons to any job, but like having that data is definitely helpful and not really having to push too hard to incentivize uh, is, is, is really lucky. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously having that data is, is great um, and then and being able to, to use it to target uh, very specifically, I like the example that you gave about birthdays and saying like, cool, your birthday's in, in November. Here's some, some ads, here's some, mm -hmm. some pr promotions or things to, to help get you back to, uh, sky yeah. zone. That's really important. Cool. With us. And birthday party is a big part of our business. Actually, it's quite, it's quite important in our world because it is, um, 
interesting point, I guess, from a marketing standpoint, so you mentioned birthdays. Not only do you bring in the person who booked the party, but they bring in their, their, their friends. So if you book a party for your, let's say you have a son who's turning 10, you book the party, all his friends are going to come in. And it's the single biggest way to drive trial, meaning the very first visit. If you ask, how did you learn about Sky Zone? What drove you here? It was a birthday general, party. Your first visit, the first one is my kid was invited to a party. And that's exactly how I learned about Sky Zone before I worked here. So I, my son turned six or five and he was invited to a party. And I was like, what is Sky Zone? And I showed up <laughs> and that was my introduction to it, which is, it turns out that's the norm. So parties are really important for driving revenue, but also driving uh, the funnel, just getting more people to understand what we are and to say, oh, this is so much fun. I'm going to come back someday on a rainy Saturday afternoon or what have you. Sure. No, that's amazing. But so, I mean, mentioning parties and having it be like one of the biggest motivators for for getting people to to come in the door. Obviously, COVID is a thing. It's been going on for the last year. As a company that focuses on on those in person experiences, how have you changed your approach and your business strategy since the the shelter in places and the the pandemic has hit last, in the last year? I'll, I'll try to not spend the next uh, 17 hours talking about us and COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I could. Uh, I mean, as a location-based business and at-home entertainment, we were shut down. And from March 2020 until July, every single one of our venues was shut. We had zero revenue. Venues are shut, zero revenue coming in. And the franchisees had leases. We had leases on the 15% that we owned. I mean, it was, it was a nightmare scenario of no revenue. But yet you have an ongoing concern with ongoing uh, bills. So it was tough. And uh, thankfully for us as a business, our private equity, uh, we, the family that starts guys own sold to a private equity company who was uh, amazingly helpful and have those deep pockets. I think we would have been in a worse situation if not <laughs> with private equity going through the period of COVID. But we did. So we, we're, we're like to the end of the tunnel now. But because of that, here's a couple of things that we did. One, um, we had a shutdown. We thought to ourselves, we need to keep engaging with our guests in a way that keeps us at least in mind, if not top of mind, at least relevant. So we got very quickly, we shifted to what we called virtual birthday parties. And um, we set, we offered for free because, you know, people are being laid off and there's a lot of economic concern. Yep. The ability to book a party with us, one of our party hosts who they, their job is to book to host parties live They're They have time in their hands. They would host via zoom up to like 15 guests. So you can invite your friends, guests, uh, friend, your, your kids, friends to a zoom birthday party. Our host would have games and like little dances depending on the age. And then in the end, they we would solicit a, a tip for that person so they could make some extra money. Some tips, some didn't, but they're really doing it for the, the love of it. And we had zero costs. It was zero out-of-pocket costs. We had a wait list so long we couldn't fulfill them all. We did that to offer utility. And, uh, you know, during COVID, a lot of companies shifted to virtual experiences. I'm proud to say we did it really early. And because of that, it actually drove a ton of publicity for us. We had a, a segment on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt about a virtual birthday party. And it was a Sky Zone party. We were in uh, TechCrunch, if you can believe it, and uh, Marie yeah. Claire, a women's magazine, a primarily women's magazine about virtual parties. So um, we drove a lot of publicity. And that was, an, you know, that was the focus of the next year. What can we do to stay relevant but not spend any money? Because there's no money coming in. There can't be any money going out. So we really leaned into publicity. We, we, we got a few stories placed about how we were um, pivoting during COVID. We pushed harder on organic social media. We did a lot of email using that database. We had that those millions of records, so we really wouldn't have any more. But one of the big things that that affected us um, is that the, we rely on our franchisees to do a lot of the marketing locally, but a lot of them furloughed their their staff because they had no their, their business are closed, their doors are shut. <coughs> so we, my team, started doing a lot of things to help the franchise owners that they wouldn't normally do. So we were sending out a lot of emails on their behalf, whereas. Typically, we provide a tool for them and guidance, but they send out their own emails when, when they want to. We would send the emails out. We were doing a lot more social responses and posts. So we want to like just roll up our sleeves and be as helpful as possible uh, for our franchise partners, which they needed the help, and it builds long-term trust. And they're relying on us to provide that backstop. And so that's what we had to do. So that was one of the big things. And the last thing I'll say is um, we pushed heavily into third-party distribution. So we now have our gift cards being sold at Target's. Uh, on Amazon, uh, we have 1,300 targets. That's been a big one. Supermarkets. We're trying to get into more, and we didn't. We were, weren't as focused on it before, but it really hit me during COVID. Okay, we need to rely on some third-party sellers also mm -hmm. to get our uh, get our cards out there more, and that's positioned us really well. That now that we're coming out of COVID, we now have our cards at all those venues. So as people start thinking about giving gifts, and now oh, people have been at home. Let's give some out-of-home entertainment type of 
gifts were now there as an option. So that was a big, a big push for us. Are you guys looking forward, uh, you know, obviously forward looking and for marketing strategies and things like what, what are you planning over the next six months, year or so that, that may be different than what you were doing before uh, the COVID hit? Obviously the gift card uh, mm -hmm. example you mentioned is, is a great way to kind of keep people on the top of mind and, and keep them engaged with, with the brand. But, you know, are there, are there things that you're looking forward to doing that you've never done before? Yeah, the gift card is a great one, but definitely more things as well. One is, um, you know, I, we have not played in the world of uh, connected TV ads. Mm -hmm. and I'm kind of curious, um, you know, when we when we bolster our, uh, our budget back up to where it needs to be, maybe getting to some more uh, uh, that type of advertising, or not more, sorry, kicking off some connected TV ads. I'm curious to see how that would do, especially now that there's more tracking available through uh, digital platforms uh, with, with uh, that type of um, advertising. So, I, I'm, are you doing that, are you doing tra traditional uh, ad buys right now? We we know you know we're not we're not a big traditional ad buyer, and the ad, at the franchise or level where I sit, the funds that we get in about half goes to things that support the franchisees like the email platform, the data segmentation, the social influencers, um, uh, social media in general, um, asset creation. The other half goes to advertising. That advertising is almost exclusively digital. So for us, because our parks are, you know, you have one in Providence, I meant, you know, mentioned that you have two in Miami, we're, we're spread out. It hasn't made a lot of sense for us to do like a big blast type of advertising because if someone's in a city where we don't have a, or suburb, we don't have a sky zone within 30 minutes, they're not gonna go. So it'd be a lot of wasted, a lot of wasted impression. So uh, we try to, we tend to do things that are more targeted. So digital is much better for that. The closest we've come to that type of broad marketing is publicity obviously because it's broad but I, I love publicity because there's the other people talking about you element of it which is so important i think your previous uh uh speaker was talking about that uh, and, and i apologize if there's background that you hear from my son I think it's so great. <laughs> I'm on zoom school and uh clearly they're on break right now so i apologize for that it's recess recess time <laughs> <laughs> it's a little embarrassing Hey, did not um, at all. I think everybody's gone through it. There is six-year-olds in the house. Um, all right, there you go. So, uh, but he's a good guy's on target uh, audience member, of course. There um, he is, right there, virtual birthdays. Is. So, also we do social media influencers. So we do quite a bit of um, of, of that. So we should like to show influencers who have the demographic that or, or audience relevant to our target market, our demographics in our venues doing something fun. We try to be creative with them. We, we let them have a lot of creative license and they do all types of fun, crazy stuff. Uh, so dunk contests, things of that nature. So that's the closest we've gotten. But uh, to answer your question, we do, we really don't do a lot of traditional advertising. Gotcha. Yeah, I did see some of the influencer videos that uh, were made uh, while I was preparing uh, to, to have this discussion with you. And they they were very, they were, they were exciting. They were like, you could definitely see the genuine fun that they were yeah. having. And I feel like that in a way really does speak to a specific audience that that you're looking to to capture. And I think that influencer marketing is is definitely uh, an awesome way for you to get your yes. brand out there. Yeah, so I got you. We got some as high as 30, 30 million um, uh, views. And that's a high one, but we've, we've had quite a quite a lot Great. of views. And one of the things that we do to get that is that we don't we have guidelines like we say, like, for example, we had a, a March mania contest around March Madness one year, which had to do with, with the three point contest on our hoops. And we said, OK, we got some influencers who are popular in the basketball space with the basketball audience. And we said, we need you to do this shot contest to showcase it, but do it in your own way. Like, how would you do this? Tell us. And so one of the things that we've done is we've really tried to give the influencers a lot of creative leeway to figure out how they want to bring it to life. And we give them a lot of like, OK, you know your audience. Yeah, you just don't, you know, we don't want you to swear and we have some brand guidelines, but tell us what you want to do or even just like improvise and, and then we'll, we'll just make sure nothing is breaking our rules or so forth. And giving them that ability to be creative has really worked. And of course, the product is good because they're they're jumping on trampolines and they're, you know, they're jumping to a foam zone doing a flip. So they're having fun. So we're having fun. Yeah. It's a good video advertising. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's amazing. Um, and there is a question. Uh, Amanda would actually love for you to talk a little bit more about the virt virtual birthday in a box. And I was actually curious, at, like, what platform are you using? Like, how 
how do you make that more of an interactive experience? Because again, it's an in-person one-to-one yeah. kind of experience. And now, you, you know, just as we're having this conversation <laughs> now, like you can still have a good experience, but it's a little different yeah. than, than being great there. Question. Great, great question. You know, it was hard, especially because we turned it on so quickly. We just went, it was a little, there's definitely some um, learning as, as we went. But um, one thing I want to say is uh, we stopped offering it because the parks are now reopened. They started opening again in July or August, depending on, where they're located. Some are still closed, sadly. Um, you know, there's certain countries that still haven't opened up, entire countries. And, um, you know, Boston area was closed for quite a while. But, you know, Fargo opened up really early in July. So we had, we, we adapted. But once we started opening up, we actually dialed back on the virtual party because we want to focus more on in person. But when it was going, we actually used Zoom and it, we did it on a shoestring. So I think if we were doing an ongoing, uh, product. If it was an ongoing product offering for us, we probably would have taken the time to say, okay, let's assess platforms. Let's figure out other ways we can uh, be more sophisticated in this. But just moving quickly, last um, April, we just went to Zoom and we made it pretty simple with a Zoom login and a unique uh, password for the, the party host to send, the parent to send to the other parents to got, get in there. What made it? And this is something that's so important, I think, for omni for omnichannel mark, uh, businesses especially entertainment businesses, what made it is the party host. Because we have, we hand selected some party hosts from the parks who are just great at entertaining kids. They have the right personality. A lot of it comes down to frankly, just their personality. They're goofy, uh, energetic. And they don't mind making like, you know, doing goofy things that other people would, would be embarrassed about, you know, putting on like, you know, crazy clothing and sunglasses and just making silly jokes. And their energy is what made it. And I actually had one of the parties for my, uh, my son was just singing for us, uh, his birthday, and we threw one. And uh, I, I did it as a, um, you know, as the guest, not as the CMO. And I looked at those eyes and the party host did such a good job because she was like talking to kids and she was commenting on what they were doing and encouraging them. And she got them on their feet and dancing and silly, like some type of TikTok dance that she had them do. And it was, so it on the person. The reason I say it's so important for my channel is that the lesson is that like once you get into a store <coughs> or an entertainment venue, a sky zone, the quality of the in-person interactions is of greater importance than you can ever imagine if you're not in this omnichannel world. And so um, the importance of marketing, working with training and operations to make sure that the brand is coming alive through those employees is really important. And that's something that I've taken away from my career in uh, out-of-home entertainment. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like we got a little off topic because we're you know focusing on data and, and marketing, but then- you know, I'm good at that. Being, it, it's a great conversation. It's, a, it's an amazing topic to talk about and it's a birthday party, come on. Um, but- you know, being able to to offer that in the time when you're the, the the parks were closed, and then looping that into the overall experience of the brand, um, and then that brings it back around to the data gathering uh, for when they do go to the to, uh, the parks and and whatnot. So, uh, very cool uh, circular marketing strategy. Thank you. Um, so, um, what? You know, obviously being the CMO, uh, you've, you've, you know, coming from the entertainment industry, what's one piece of career advice that you could share uh, with individuals who uh, are watching um, that would that led you into the CMO role and, and what what types of uh, you know tips and tricks and, and things that, you know, did you focus on? Yeah, and uh, there's a piece of advice that I, I, I've, I've given when I've been asked this question and, and it's really, I think, important to, to me and to my career. And it's that I've always been very knowledge oriented. And I highly recommend people, and it sounds, you know, it sounds like a cliche, I'm saying be knowledge oriented. But what I mean by that, let me add some details. What I mean by that is, um, especially today, it's very easy to be knowledge oriented in your field. Like there are people who are 10 miles deep in SEO. I bet there are people listening to this who are SEO experts will know more than I'll ever know. You know, they'll know more in their, in their pinky than I'll know about SEO because they, they're so deep in it. And in, in today's world, in digital marketing pulls you in these type of silo directions. The people who are so knowledgeable about how, you know, how digital ads are placed and matched, uh, you know, and the, the intricate details of digital advertising, the plumbing behind the scenes, like the people who know so much about that. So you get pulled into these, into these silos. And I think, you know, in naturally what happens is that you start becoming an expert in that area. Um, what I recommend to anybody, and I've seen this, uh, people who've been successful, and it's worked for me, is to try your best to be broad in your knowledge. 
And, uh, and when I say that, it's like, know as much as you can about marketing, different areas of marketing, have exposure to it, but also outside of marketing. It's so important to understand finance. I think a lot of marketers who are more creative by nature or more interested in, and uh, motivated by creative endeavors, they don't take the time to really understand finance. But if you want to grow in your career, one day own your own business, one day become a senior executive, maybe even a CMO, you need to understand the mechanics of, 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 of finance. So that when you're in a, you are an executive in your meeting and you're talking about the PL, you're talking about projections, you're talking about um, just the overall balance sheet and how the company's doing. You don't want to just sit there and, and kind of think to myself, oh my God, I don't like math and I'm confused and this, I don't get it. You want to be able to participate in those conversations. So you need to understand the basics. So something I've advised, for example, is if you're in marketing, befriend somebody in finance, especially in the area called FPA, uh, financial planning analysis, you know, and ask them. Very few people probably do this. Like, what do you do? Can you just can you just show me what you do and how you do an analysis? What do you do? Yeah. What the heck do you do? In F- what is that? What do you do? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, do that. Take the time to figure that out. Um, when I was very young at Universal, my boss's boss hated being involved in the budget, and he looked at me and said, "Oh, you you know seem like you're pretty good numbers." So he brought me along to his budget meetings, and um, and uh, I over time I got more involved in the budget, sitting down with the finance folks. And he stopped going, so he got it. You handle it. And it was really <laughs> I was really young, with low on the totem pole, but as a budget guy, suddenly I had all this power because people come to me like, "Hey, do we have money in the budget for this?" Or could you try to find money? And the people who were like higher well, ranking than me on the or, or chart, and it was very hierarchical at Universal. We're now looking at me as a guy who had some influence over the budget, but that was great. But what really matters is that I understood the mechanics and how the budget worked, and um, that was very important to me. So now when I'm in meetings with uh, talking about the future of the company planning when we sold the company to private equity buyers and I was part of the pitch to be able to be conversant about the basics of finance, not to be a finance professional, but to understand it, that means a lot. I think that a lot of uh, uh, people in the marketing world don't take the time to do that. But I would say, you know, sit down with somebody in a different part of the company, invite them to a virtual coffee during COVID or when we're back to real life, invite them to lunch, just ask them like, what do you do? What's important in your role? Like what are some challenges you guys have and you've overcome? People love talking about themselves. Clearly, I'm talking here at Lonstop. Um, <laughs> but, you know, people love talking about themselves. So give them the opportunity just to tell you about their job and just start absorbing the different things. You don't have to do that role, but the more you know, the better. And the analogy I'll leave you with is this. Like a great comedians are able to draw on all types of different pieces of information and tie them together to make a joke in, 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 in unique, creative ways. But the best comedians are able to pull something out of politics and pull something out of you know current events and pull something out of history or pull something out of a TV show and mush them together. I feel like a really good executive kind of has to do that same thing. You have to be able to pull a lot of information together um, from your company, from other industries. And so the more you know, the more you're able to um, make those type of, um, you know, connect the dots to use a cliche, but then that helps you um, plan and present new ideas and see things differently. So I'd say just gather knowledge and uh, be a, be a learning machine. I like it that that advice is I think it's it's timeless in that you know just just stay curious and stay yes. you know want wanting to pull information wanting to hear about what other people are doing and what yeah. other roles there are and how you can make those connections into marketing decisions or your your role is even like you know what what next you want to you want to do uh, with your career and in, in your life right. so I think that's that's amazing. Um, Amazing advice. Um, so for me, like I, I'm a community guy. I, I work with uh, a lot of the sellers uh, with Fiverr, and for me, success stories are a big thing. I really love the story, and I think you know, obviously talking about it. While wow, the the success story of uh, the birthday parties and how successful those have been, are there any other stories that you can share with us um, that have? May, may not necessarily have been something that you expected to come out of uh, the last year or so. Um, from from this or or anything really? Yeah, that's a great question. You know what jumps to my mind when you say that is um, from the last year, our guest counts, as you can imagine, are way down. First of all, we were closed, so they went to zero. So that's <laughs> zero. <pretty> yeah, <laughs> that's not the definition of way down. I don't know what it is. So we were at zero, but then when we opened up our our parks, it, it, what happens is that some percentage of the people in the local market said, "I'm willing to go back." For whatever reason, uh, I'm, not, I'm not worried about COVID, or I, I had it. I don't think I'm gonna. I think I'm okay, or I'm just whatever reason, I'm willing to go back. And by the way, we put in tons of cleaning 
procedures. That was one of the other changes that we did that I should have mentioned before. Is like we put so much time and effort into our cleaning processes, our the, the ways we're cleaning, how often we're cleaning. We have videos about it. That was a big thing, and my team was very involved in that in terms of communicating it. But so when we opened up, we sh shared all the ways that we're cleaning. Some people said, "Great, I'm ready. I'm coming back." I wear my mask, I'll come back. And some said, no way, no way in the world am I going to go back. So it's a mix. But because of that, your guest counts are down. And we're slowly, little by little, it's it's going back to where more people are willing to come back. Or, you know, I don't want to say we're over the last year, but we're at least we're coming back to where we want to be. Um, where am I going with all this? Guest counts are down. One of the things that yep. surprised me is that during this time, we've been able to get more money from each guest. So we've been able to increase the average check from the guests, those who those who did come back, we've actually been generating more revenue per guest. I thought coming out of COVID is going to be like highly promotional. We're going to have to discount, 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 discount. Um, and uh, to some extent, we have had to do a little bit of that. But once the uh, people have come, they, maybe they buy 90 minutes instead of 60 because you buy blocks of time. We have been really... Uh, focus on our membership model with recurring revenue. So we're living in a membership world, right? You have membership to your gym and membership to this, that. And, you know, everyone's got 20 memberships now to uh, Spotify. To everywhere. Right? To everywhere, yeah. <laughs> so subscriptions. We to, I mean, you're basically a subscription model, yeah. Subscription model world. So we're also, in entertainment in general, is trying to get into the subscription world. So we've been selling our membership. So that generates more revenue per visitor than non because it's a recurring stream every month. So rather than just paying once and not coming back for another eight months, now you're getting a little bit of money every month. So <clears throat> we've been able to increase the amount of money per guest. Another part of that is um, my team designs limited time design socks. And um, what we do is we have a base coat. Let me go back a second. We have an orange sock with little grippies on the bottom, little pieces mm -hmm. of like rubber that you have to wear when you go to our parks. And that's something that we jet, we started doing and all the other parts copied. So maybe the local one that you mentioned in your area, maybe you have those type of socks. And it's a requirement. And you can bring them back. So you buy them once, but you're allowed to bring them back. If you bring them and wash them, that's fine. But you need to wear them so that the shoes and dirt aren't being tracked onto the trampoline. Um, and it's a little safer with the little non-skid things in the bottom. So we, we've, for years and years and years, sold an orange version, which everyone knows the sky zone is their color. We started selling every quarter a limited edition, specially designed sock, maybe like an Argyle sock. We did a pink sock every October for breast cancer awareness uh, a donation. Some of the money went to um, American Cancer Society and other such partners. Um, and now we've actually transitioned to every single day of the year when you go to one of our parks, and most all the parks now, you have an option of the basic orange or these three other designs, uh, a camo design, like a, like a blue, mm -hmm. blue and orange camo, just fun stuff like a, an Argyle, yeah. like you mentioned, we have one that's tacos. And so what my team is doing is designing new socks. Taco socks. Oh, no. <laughs> Taco one's fun. We have matching mask. And, <laughs> and so we say you can buy the basic sock for three bucks, but these better quality, higher up on the calf. Oh, the great one we have now is a classic gym sock, which is very, very uh, of the moment. Like uh, I mentioned, like 83 style, like, you know, tall white socks with some stripes on it, doing great. Uh, but for $6, whatever, whatever the franchisee price is at, you can buy this higher price sock. And maybe because parents aren't going out as much with their kids, maybe the parents have some guilt that the kids have been cooped up. So they're nag factor when they say, I want that one instead is a little stronger, more effective, or they have some savings because they're not going out to eat, but we're selling a lot more of those premium socks. So we've been able to generate a lot more. So that's, um, that's something that's been surprising. And I want to give a plug to Fiverr. This is a true story. When we first started launching our designs limited design socks we actually went to fiverr and uh got a few people to submit sock designs for us and that was i think how we first started designing a couple of these we've, we've since brought it in-house we have an in-house graphic designer now who does a lot of that work but we actually did that through uh the fiverr platform so a little historic connection um perfect who would have thought sock design uh yeah so uh we've been able to uh make up for the lack of Make up for the decrease in jumpers to some extent by yes. increasing the revenue per jump. Very cool. Um, that's a great story, uh, especially being able to tie it back into fiber sellers, uh, which is you know why we're all here to try to help 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 fiber sellers be more successful. Um, the comments have been amazing. Everybody's loving the connection between data science and uh, marketing. So. Um, 
I want to thank you for jumping in here, uh, Josh, and, and sharing your insights um, and just how adaptable a company can be uh, under really, really strange circumstances over the last uh, year or so. It's been my pleasure. I love talking about marketing. Uh, I love what you guys do. You've asked some great questions. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, love to do it again sometime. This has been great. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks again, Josh. Thank you.